church uh, in uh, Côte d'Ivoire uh, for 13 years, from 1994. I left Germany, stopped school, stopped everything, came to join the uh, admissions team in Abidjan to go start the church in Cameroon, but I ended up staying in Abidjan. So in total, I spent 10 years in Côte d'Ivoire, and then the other years in Cameroon, led the church, planted another church. So did that for 13 years, felt the need to go back to school, resigned, went back to finish a degree course. And for the past many years now, I've worked in the corporate world, in the telecom IT industry, but use my free time to serve in my area of passion. I love the Bible, I love the word, and I love to encourage people to love the word and go deeper. So I'm gonna to try to do a bit of that tonight. Uh, with the class on the seven churches. So without wasting any time, I'm going to go ahead, share my screen for those who are online. And those of us who are already here, we, are, we can already see the slide is already up there. I hope I'm already online. And those online, I hope you can hear me and hope you can see. Praise God. So the seven churches of Revelation, the privilege I have tonight is to talk about Something that's really close to my heart. Uh, something that's really close to my heart uh, because I've had the privilege to actually visit all of these seven sites of the ancient sites where all of these seven churches were found that we know they are mentioned in the book of Revelation. So the title is The Seven Churches of Revelation. Are we together? And we know the book of Revelation, uh, I don't have enough time to give a big introduction, but it's a very special book written in special symbolic language called apocalyptic language, which you find in books like Daniel, Ezekiel, a few of it even in the New Testament, you'll find it in Matthew 24, you find a few uh, books, uh, even in some chapters like in Peter, but mainly in Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, these are very symbolic uh, languages that the Jews and Jewish Christians were very familiar with. And we don't have time to explore that deeply, but the language used in this book is apocalyptic and prophetic, talking about what is to come as prophetic. Uh, the book is generally believed to be written by John the Apostle, um, and, and it's possible that it's, there's another John that some think it might be him, but most scholars believe it was John the Apostle who actually wrote the book. The meaning of any book of the Bible must first be based on what the, the book meant to the people that it was written to primarily. So if you're studying Corinthians, Corinthians was not written to you and now. It was written to a church in Corinth, in a particular situation, in a particular city, and a particular culture that they were going through. It's only when you now understand what the message meant to the Corinthians at that time, then you can turn around and say, does that same principle apply to us today? But if you read Corinthians as if it was written to you, you misinterpret a lot of things. So we can't study any book of the Bible, and that includes this uh, part of the Bible, the seven churches. We must first establish what did the message mean to the people in John's time, in the places, specific places, uh, where these uh, books were written to, and we have seven churches here, and the audience also, you must understand. And by the time we look at a few of these, you understand better what I mean by that. It was written to one, and also to comfort God's people during a very challenging time, under the Roman era, where some emperors like Nero and Domitian, Roman emperors, require that people should worship them, what they call emperor worship. So they, they, like Nebuchadnezzar, okay, the statue, he was expected to be worshipped. So these emperors demanded that the people worship them as gods. And so any person that shows up, like a Jesus, the, the Gospel of Mark introduces Jesus as an emperor. So Jesus became like a competitor or a threat to emperor worship. And so the Christians had to choose between which emperor are we going to worship? Are we going to worship Domitian or are we going to worship Jesus? 
So that was the challenge. And so intense persecution did result from the fact that the Christians in this era had to choose. They had to choose which allegiance they're going to belong to. And so the book opens and as a secular letter that was sent to seven churches. And the book of Revelation, seven is an important number, meaning completeness. And so this, the, the message sent to these seven churches is like a universal message, kind of, that we can also benefit from. That we need to, first of all, approach it as letters written to those specific seven churches that we can see on the screen. Are we together? Uh, there was a vision of Jesus and the seven burning lampstands, lights, a symbol of the seven churches. But these churches were specifically based in a part of the world called Anatolia or Asia Minor, which is today mostly in modern day Turkey. But this is like the western part of Asia. Okay, Asia, Turkey happens to be a bridge between Asia and Europe. Okay, they are connecting those two continents. That's where it's located. And so these seven churches were in that region at the time. Um, so Jesus starts in this book by addressing each church based on their peculiar situation and their peculiar challenges. Some were becoming lukewarm, apathetic in their faith. Others were morally compromised, but others remained faithful to Jesus as their emperor. So you have different types of situations among the seven churches. And there was a call for them to overcome the challenges of their time, especially the persecution through being faithful to Jesus in the face of persecution, as I mentioned, due to especially the emperor worship as they worshiped, uh, especially Nero and even Domitian. Nero was the one who decreed that he should be worshiped, but especially Domitian came uh, some years later and really persecuted the Christians heavily. So I've already mentioned that all seven churches in the book are situated in one big church, <clears throat> which was Anatolia at the time. And you can see on the map, on this map, the, the revelation came to John while he was on the island of Patmos. You can see it right there. On, it's a Greek island, but geographically much closer to Turkey than to Greece. Um, the privilege I had was I was able to visit this place. I'm going to show you a few pictures soon. But in, oh, thank you so much. Dry air. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm grateful. I think the air, in, the air here is quite dry. Thank you so much. The water of life. And my voice is restored. Amen. So in October last year, I had the, I had the opportunity to visit all these seven sites. And it was almost like rewinding 2,000 years back to visit history and reconstruct the story of the ancient church. It was an amazing experience. But I visited actually in 2013. I visited a few of them. But last year there was another tour that was going to take us to all the seven. So the few I visited nine years ago, we revisited, but this time we went from one side to the other. We started in Laodicea. So, so normally the letter was, will, will leave Patmos and will be delivered first to Ephesus, then Smyrna, then Pergamon, then Thyatira, then Sardis, then Philadelphia, and the last one is Laodicea. So it was a secular letter that the messenger would take and go round from Ephesus all the way around, as you can see on the map. But what we did in our tour is that we started by visiting, in last year, we started by visiting Laodicea, and then we came to Philadelphia, by road with a bus, then Sardis, then Theatira. Then it was already almost evening, and we now drove straight to Smyrna, where we needed to spend the night in a hotel. So we visited Smyrna that day. The next day, we, sp we spent the entire day visiting Ephesus, and then the Next day again, we went to Pergamon because they were a bit far. And, and, and Ephesus is a huge site. Like you, you, you can spend days visiting Ephesus. Uh, and so um, that was the experience we had. I'm going to recommend two books that you can just write down. There's one called The Lost Letters of Pergamon. 
the lost letters of Pergamum. I'll show you my brother uh, uh, this morning about you know, just, just a, a great story, uh, uh, an, an imaginative story that built on the biblical background of, of this time. That really talks about the emperor worship and what was going on during that time, what it meant to be a Christian in that era. Uh, and reading that will really help put a lot of flesh into what the Christians were going through during this time. Another interesting book is called A Week in the Life of Corinth. A Week in the Life of Corinth. If you Google it, I didn't write the names of the authors, but you Google it, it will come up easily. Not a big deal. So um, let me just show you quickly some, a few pictures from the island of Patmos. So this was my first visit in 2013, nine years ago. On the left is what is believed to be the, a cave. So there's a door. When you go through that door, we're not allowed to take pictures inside. But this is the cave where John was on a Sunday morning when he received the revelation. When we got in there, I had goosebumps. It's unbelievable. Okay? So that's what you see on the left. On the right, that's me standing, and you can have a view of the island, of the other parts of the island of Patmos. It's a beautiful place. It's an incredibly beautiful place. So this is uh, from 2013 uh, on that visit. And you can, have a, you can have a fuller view of the island with me out of the way there. Um, I mean, yeah, this is like a short video. Um, OK, I took a short video, uh, which those, those online might, might see, but we're not able to play. Maybe if you just click like the yeah, we, uh, just click, let's see if it comes OK. So it'll just give you a view. I'll just try to go around so you get a, a better view of the surrounding of the island. So I'm standing on the island, and there are other neighboring islands, as you can see. And just to give us a, a fuller view of the surrounding. Oh. Here we are. So I was just making a, I couldn't even speak, I was speechless. Okay? I was just babbling. I was listening to myself today. I was like, oh, I didn't see I was just babbling. Because I was just so moved to stand on history, biblical history. Okay, so that's the region, and as we saw on the map, the revelation came from there, as you see on the map, and then it had to start in Ephesus, okay? Um, we, might, we might not, what I'm gonna do on this particular one, I'm not gonna follow the chronology we see in the Bible, I'll follow the chronology of the tour I did last year, walking back, well, backwards. So I'm starting with uh, our visit of Laodicea. And between, very close to Laodicea, you find a biblical place called Erapolis, mentioned in the book of Colossians in chapter 4. So Erapolis, you can see this. Is, I was in the bus when I took this picture. So we were coming in, and you can see an arrow directing you to Erapolis, and another arrow directing you to Laodicea. They call it Laodicea in the, in the local language there. So let's start with, so in Erapolis, there's an interesting site there. What will you say, the, the white stuff there, what will you, what, what, what Guess what the white stuff is? That's my question. What will you guess? Salt, yes. Salt, it could be salt, it could be snow, right? Okay. But I think it's closer to salt. It's, it's, it's a chemical substance called sodium bicarbonate. And uh, that's a chemical name. But when it melts, it forms hot water. So it forms water hot water springs until date lots of tourists flock there to go and bathe in hot water and it actually has medicinal medical benefits yes it does have a lot of medical benefits and so this is a picture i, I took you can see people right there in the water right so if you go in there you will find that the water is well, over time, it get kind of like dilutes a bit, but it's warm or hot, depending on where you're standing. If you're standing from the very source, it's hot water. So what happens is that this water now, if we had, I didn't put up a map up there. I had a full class on that. I didn't have that here. But if you look at even just um, in that region, where you see Laodicea, I have another map. I could have put it up here. You will see Erapolis and Colossae. They are very close to each other. So Erapolis is like north of Laodicea on a hill. And then Colossae is like south 
of Laodicea, and Laodicea is like in the middle. So what will happen often is that when these hot water springs form, they will join a river called the Lycus River, and they will flow a few kilometers down the road. Here we use kilometers, right, and not miles. So a few kilometers down the road, it gets to Laodicea. But the problem is, when it gets to Laodicea, the hot water that it was when it was in Hierapolis is no more hot. It's now lukewarm. By the time it gets to Laodicea. And when it continues flowing further down, it gets to Colossae. By the time it gets to Colossae, it's no more hot as in Hierapolis. It's neither lukewarm as in Laodicea. It is now cold. And in the culture and in the understanding of the times back then, they perceived the hot water of Hierapolis as very useful for medical purposes. Now, the cold water in Colossae was also useful if you are thirsty and you, want, you need to quench your thirst, you could drink the cold water. Or if it's a hot day, you can bathe in that cold water and you are refreshed. The problem was the lukewarm water of Laodicea. They didn't know what to do with that lukewarm water. <laughs> if you try drinking lukewarm coffee, it's terrible, right? Especially if you add milk to it. Ah! Oh! And what Jesus tells the Laodiceans, he says, you are lukewarm and I feel like vomiting you. So he was not, for a long time, I interpreted that scripture by saying, Jesus wants us to either be hot committed to him but if you are not fully committed to him he will prefer you to be cold that means leave the church stop doing anything about god don't be one leg in one leg out that's how i preached that lesson when i saw the geography the message is he's telling them you're becoming as useless as your lukewarm water they were becoming ineffective in their faith first peter 2 uh, uh, Second Peter one talks about the fact we need to add faith, add this, add that. He says if you possess all these qualities, they will prevent you from being ineffective and productive in your relationship with God, isn't it? So he was calling them to effectiveness. Where we used to preach and understand the scripture, he wants everybody to be safe. He wants everybody to be zealous for him. That's what God wants. But the point was, in the culture of that time, he understood the culture and the geography of the region. The people got the message. And the message was, you're becoming useless. You better wake up and be useful for me. Otherwise, I'll vomit you. Do you see what culture, geography, history does to our understanding of scripture? So from that day, I stopped preaching false doctrine. <laughs> we together, brothers and sisters. <laughs> and he also tells them in verse 17, you say I am rich. You see, this city was very wealthy. Now they say that was like the center. It was like a Johannesburg. And it's so wealthy that when an earthquake destroyed the city, the Roman government that was ruling at that time, Asia was one of the provinces of the Roman Empire, the, the Rome wanted to rebuild the city, but they were so wealthy, they told them, keep your money, we don't need your money. And on their own, they rebuilt their city. They had a thriving medical industry where they used to treat eyes. And even the wool in that region is very good for clothing. So they were so wealthy. And so he's telling them, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize how that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. It's funny to tell people who are rich that they're actually poor. Buy from me white clothes. They had a very wealthy clothing industry. Buy from me white clothes to wear because you're actually naked even though you think you're you're well dressed so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve 
to put and make the Laodiceans so proud. Be it their money, their wealth, be it their clothing industry, be it their uh, medical industry, the treatment of eyes. There was like a, it was like a medical hub for the treatment of eyes. They were very advanced. And he's using those same things that they are very proud about to tell them you're actually naked. You're actually poor. You're actually blind. You're becoming ineffective. That was the message at the time. Can that message be applicable to us today? Is it applicable to us today? We can apply it to our lives individually and we can apply it to our lives as a body, especially coming out of COVID, right? But we just need to, we need to learn to live once again. We need to learn to be effective. So we need to be a careful of a sense of self-sufficiency and we need others. How is it going in that area of our life? I could dwell and heal and hit hard on that, but let me move on to the next. So I've already mentioned how it was a wealthy city, the background, there's so much information. I have the information on slides. I have a lot of notes. You want to spend time doing a deep study on Laodicea. You find there we did go to Philadelphia. That's most of the ancient ruins of the ancient city of Philadelphia. So some of these sites that we visited, like Laodicea, is a completely archaeologists had to completely dig it up to unearth the ancient city. And there's no real city there. There's a neighboring rural kind of area. We stayed in a hotel there, but it's mainly touristic. People stay there and they go visit those sites. But there's no real thriving city. But in Philadelphia, we found a thriving city that is still there today. But within that thriving city, you see sort of certain pieces of ruins of the ancient biblical city. So this is an example of the picture, wall, a picture of the ancient wall of the city back then. Most cities back then used to have a wall to protect the city. So this is a, a piece of the ancient city of Philadelphia. We did visit some other sites while we were there. But this particular church, there were so many positives. There were only positives that Jesus addressed to them. They had kept Jesus' words faithfully. They had not de denied his name. They had kept his command to endure patiently when you read the entire letter. And there was intense persecution by what they call the synagogue of Satan. But the, the disciples endured and persevered. So, so Jesus only had positives to give them. And there was an open door before them. There was a new name. They, were, they had the key of David. There were so many in very great promises. The next verse tells you, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So unlike some other churches where you have something to say positive about them and then you have some correction, this particular church, there was no correction. There was nothing negative. It was all positive. And one of the messages we can get from this church is that if you ever feel small, you say, he said, you have little strength. I know that you have little strength. Yet you have kept my word and will not deny my name in spite of the persecution that they were going through. So if you ever feel small for one reason or the other, read this encouraging short letter to the church in Philadelphia. Amen? And there are people like that who are quiet on song heroes in the faith. They are in the church. They are faithful. They serve faithfully. They might not be in front. They might not be pronounced. But they are there year after year. I, be, I believe when I went to Umtata, I met some of those people there. Some of them have been there for since, since 30 years. I met a brother who was been baptized since 92, some 96, and bigger city like this, but they are there and they are faithful. That, that they're just holding on to God. I admire those small. My passion is victories that I've not had a visit for at least five years. I went to Libreville, Gabon. They don't have store of an entire district. 
that he's the leader of the church. He's busy in his medical profession and try giving his best to lead the church that is there. Others work in a bank, others are teachers. They all they basically are doing stuff, but they are giving their best to stay faithful to God, holding on to Jesus. Little strength, but they are faithful to God. Amen, brothers and sisters. The next church, Sadis. Oh, this church has some rich history. Do this class in such a short time. There's so much more to say. But the rich history of this region, they, 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 it used to be led, uh, at some point in history, there was a kingdom called the Lydian Kingdom who had, overthrown, who had, who had been overthrown by the Persians. And what happened is, if you see on the picture, you see a hill at the back there, right? So what happened is, when they were attacked, okay, the Persians attacked them, what happened is, they had like a citadel, they had like a stronghold built on top of that hill, with walls all around, protected from all angles. But what happened is, some Persians at night, one of the soldiers that was protecting, you know, the, the, the city up there on the hill, one of the soldiers, his helmet fell off from on top and fell all the way down. And he had now to take a particular path at night to come down and pick up his helmet. And while he was taking that path, the patients were in the dark watching. So they were able to see the path that he used to come down. And so they waited like the following night when they were all sleeping and they now used that path and attacks at night. And so when you read that disease, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will do what? I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. What is he referring to here? He's re referring to their history. How the Persians attacked like a thief in the night. And the message here is, spiritually speaking, we often do have moments where our guards are down. And Satan, who is a thief, who watching, we're constantly on his radar. Moving around town here, especially on uh, in the, in the Randberg side, when I was staying with the boaters, I, was, I walked for like 12 kilometers almost yesterday uh, around the neighborhood. And I saw a lot of, uh, uh, you know, you see walls, you know, gates and walls, and they'll put a sign there. They said, Look, uh, this place is being watched. Okay? And if you, if you, if you, if you joke, there will be an armed response. Let me tell you, Satan always has us on his, on his radar. You can be strong for as long as you and your guards are down. <laughs> for me, my guards easily are down when I'm exhausted. My guards are easily down when I'm discouraged. That's when sin becomes appealing. So when I'm exhausted, when I'm tired, when I'm discouraged, there are things I try to avoid. I know myself to an extent, in 30 years, I've had my struggles. When I'm in that, if I'm watching the TV, it might just be sports, something very neutral, where I know I trust that I can stand in front. Things where funny scenes show up, at any time, at those unguarded moments, I know my resistance is not as good, so I better stay away. We gotta know ourselves. Because Satan knows us. He knows our weakness, whether it's pornography, whether it's alcohol, whether it's telling lies, whether it's anger. He knows our weaknesses, he knows our tendencies, and we gotta know because Satan knows. And we gotta watch for those unguarded moments. Are we together, brothers and sisters? This place was notorious. 
This is a picture I took of the ancient city inside of Theatira, but surrounded by a modern city. So what we see here was one of those uh, agora, which is like the Aeropagos. That's an agora. It's a marketplace. It's a public, public place where they do business, where they exchange, where politics, people come and speak, philosophers come and do all that stuff. So this was the agora or the marketplace, the ancient marketplace in Theatira. But you can see those tall buildings. The modern city is built all around. But this was the ancient to, uh, there. So it, it was a city where everybody was trying to get ahead of others. Okay? Business. To me, it sounds pretty much like Lagos. Ah, Lagos. Every, there's a saying in Lagos shine your eye. When you arrive in Lagos, you must shine your eye. I know what I'm talking about. Okay? So. It's a city where everybody tries to get ahead of everybody. And they have these business associations called business uh, guilds or guys. I don't know how you pronounce it well in English. A city where everybody's trying to get ahead. And there were conditions to be part of these associations. Okay? And at times, it meant wild and pain, commit immorality. And you had to practice those things to be part of the association. And then when you're part of that association, you get business opportunities. It's a networking thing. But it forces you to compromise. If you don't compromise and join their feast and their immorality, you're not part of the club. In the IT world where I've worked, I've known salespeople who have to do their job at night, go to nightclubs, go to some funny, funny places to strike business deals, okay? It was that kind of city, okay? There was drunkenness, there was corruption, all kinds of practice. And so, uh, I think there's even another picture. Uh, this picture here, the next slide, is actually written in Greek, and this was like one of the policies written there in inscription to be a fit for me, but it forced you to compromise. So that was the nature of every trade, each one. Of, and then they were very good with dye. The dye industry was very prosperous there. And in this letter, he has positives to tell the church about their love, their faith, their person. They were even doing more than what they were doing before in certain areas, just like the city could easily be comp compromising. Uh, tolerating a prophet called Jezebel, these are Old Testament concepts. So to understand Revelation or to understand books like Hebrews, Revelation, you must understand this Old Testament notion. So this is not the Jezebel of the Old Testament. They tolerate those people who teach and all kinds of horrible practices. That was the kind of message that was sent to this church. And so they, 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 they were called to beware of societal pressures. Okay? Where we want to look like the society. We're tempted to want to belong. We're tempted to want to be like the world. Romans 12 says, do not, okay, be conformed. But instead be transformed. But these guys... Easily, there was a pressure to compromise and to look like the rest of the world. Do we still have those pressures today? We absolutely do have them. And so we need to be aware of those pressures. Smyrna. Smyrna is another very interesting church. Uh, a port city, beautiful city. Oh, man, I loved Smyrna. I didn't want to leave that city. And very renowned. They were very renowned for the practice called the emperor worship, which I mentioned earlier. And the city had two large temples dedicated to the worship of emperors. So this was a big problem in Smyrna. And the picture here from last year, exactly one year ago, October last year, I was standing there again in the ancient agora of Smyrna. But you can see behind that there's a modern city all around. Okay, you can see some buildings behind there. But this is the ancient spot from 2,000 years plus ago. And so uh, they even have some incredible structures on the ground. In the next slide, we visited all around. This is all part of that ancient structure. 
What's the message to them? I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. It's like the opposite of Laodicea, right? I, I know your poverty, yet you are rich. The Laodiceans believed that they were rich, yet they were poor. You see the contrast. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. My goodness. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Because of the emperor worship, they were going to be persecuted if they deny the emperor and they confess Jesus. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. That's a, a big theme in all of these letters. He's encouraging them to overcome the challenges. And overcoming means being faithful to Jesus. Overcoming means not giving in to all those pressures. And the question here is, what are the things in our lives that are constantly fighting to claim our allegiance? Is it work? Is it comfort? Is it, what are the things that are trying to replace Jesus, replace God in our hearts and in our lives? Because Jesus is our true emperor and he deserves our undivided devotion. We cannot share Caesar. We cannot share Caesar and Jesus. And we cannot share Jesus with any other modern gods that we have. There are all kinds of modern gods today. And we've got to make sure that Jesus remains on the throne of our hearts. Amen? There's a lot I could have said there, but because of time, let's move on. Ephesus. This city was also known for the worship of especially Artemis, the goddess, okay? It was the great Greek goddess, Diana or Artemis, uh, depending on if you use the Greek word or not. And he also had a lot of economic and cultural vibrancy. There was a, it was a seaport city. So it was very wealthy. It's one of the biggest sites that you will visit. You can, inspire, you can spend days visiting Ephesus. So much history. It was known as a temple warden, okay? One of those cities that, that really practice uh, emperor worship. So they call it temple warden of the goddess of Artemis. And it was also a temple warden dedicated to imperial call to worship other emperors. Uh, it was one of the chief cities of the province of Asia uh, from that first century. It was ruled by the emperors of Rome. Um, the city of Asia not only obeyed the emperor's commands, like paying taxes to them, but also recognized his immense power over them by establishing temples to dedicate to the emperor, to worship the emperor. And so representatives of all the cities of the province will come there to sacrifice to the emperor and sacrifice to their gods. So this was the kind of uh, uh, city that Ephesus was. And here we are visiting, this is a picture I took last year, October last year. Uh, here we're actually visiting, we're very close to two of the temples where they used to worship emperors at the time. There was one called Trojan. This worship Trojan, very close to the site where, we're, where I'm standing here on the picture. So it was a big practice of the time. In the message to this church, he said, I hold this against you. After saying a lot of positive things to them, how they were still hardworking, they were persevering, they hated some false teachers like the Nicolaitans, who were very heretical within the church, teaching about compromising with pagan society, but they were resisting even that false teacher and false teachings. They had a lot of positives, but the one thing is they had forsaken the love that they had at first, their first love, okay? He says, consider how far you've fallen, repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So they had a lot of positives but they had some negatives and they were called to return to their first love. And part of the challenge was, he says, repent and do the things you did at first. I overheard in a conversation, I think yesterday, that we've been working on obedience here in Soweto, right? Okay? And I think that's wonderful. That we want to go back to do the things we used to do before. But my encouragement will be, let's do it with our hearts. Let's not, just, let's not just do it mechanically. Let's not just go through the motions. Let it be from our hearts. And one of the challenges I gave in Umtata when I did Hebrews is that our understanding of Jesus needs to continuously grow over time. The Jesus I knew and that I fell in love with 30 years ago, 
I need to be better at my knowledge of Jesus now. And that was the core in Colossians. It was calling them and focusing them on Jesus instead of being distracted by false teachers, philosophies. It was a call even in the book of Hebrews. After 20 years plus, they were tempted to even go back to Judaism. And he was now presenting Jesus to them as superior to Moses, to the angels, to the priests, to the high priest, to the sacrificial system. We need to continuously grow in our love for Jesus. As we grow in our love for Jesus, it will show in our actions. Let not just be action and our hearts are empty. Our hearts need to continue to grow. And that will show in the things we will do for God. Amen? And the last one on the list, Pegamum. In the order in which we visited last year, Pegamum was known as the citadel of kings. In fact, the name Pegamum means a citadel, a stronghold for kings. As you can see on the picture, it was built on top of a hill, high up there. And surround, the surrounding atmosphere was valley, way down. So it was a great place for protection of kings. But up there also, they worshipped the different emperors. Okay, There was intense uh, emperor worship in Pergamon. And so you even find the story of a man called Antipas who was killed. And the book I recommended, The Lost Letters of uh, Pergamon, was some findings that they found in digging in this site. And those findings led to the writing of that book. And in the book, they portray how Antipas used to be the one promoting emperor worship until he got converted and was now promoting Jesus. And because he switched camps, he got killed. That's a bit of the history behind that. And there's so much more you will explore if you take time to study and to read the book I recommended. And so there were some positives. They did not renounce faith in Jesus amid persecution. For example, Antipas was a great example. But the negatives was there were the Balaamites who hold to the teaching that it is okay to sacrifice eat food sacrifice to idols, commit sexual immorality. So there were some of the teachings similar to the teachings we saw in Ephesus. There was a lot of connection between those two places. But Pergamum was an incredible site to visit. I wish I had time to really dig in. It says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Because Pergamum was like the capital of all these seven cities. And in Pergamum, em emperor worship was the most intense in Pergamum. So they call it the, the Satan, a place where Satan has his throne. But in spite of that, you remain true to my name. You do not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. That's the background of that city. And an excerpt of the book that I, that I found really interesting, I really don't have time to read it. It will just, it will just go way overboard. But you'll find it in my notes. I, I put an excerpt in that book. So in conclusion, you'll find that this saying, I know, I know, I know. You'll find it in all the letters. I know your situation. I know your deeds. I see your deeds. God knows us. And I like what you guys started doing here, asking the question, if Jesus was going to write a letter to the church in Soweto, what would he say? And it's a good thing. Now we have all these seven letters and their background. And my hope and my prayer is that with this background, you can go and dig further. A scripture in the Old Testament, Second Chronicles says, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I pray it will be those who are fully committed. Now, whatever the Spirit is telling us in Soweto, we will learn from our first century brothers and sisters. I will make whatever correction we need to make. And to God be the glory. Thank you.